about. And in May, we'll have uh, my colleague Peter Jaffe from uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering talking about PFAS contamination and, uh, and the remediation strategy that he has, which turns out to be the only one in the world at the moment um, that we know of that can actually remediate this particular class of, of uh, contaminant. So that's our program for the rest of the semester. I hope you'll join us. Um, today's speaker uh, probably needs no introduction for almost everyone here. That's uh, Isaac Held, uh, longtime uh, senior research scientist at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab, GFDL, uh, and lecturer with the rank of professor in geosciences and the AOS, Atmospheric Oceanic Sciences program, and a longtime associated faculty member uh, with us in PEI. Uh, uh, Isaac uh, has done remarkable work in climate science, uh, some of which uh, uh, has focused on things like the impact of climate change on the water cycle, as well as the distribution of, of winds across the earth. Uh, the second of these I think we'll hear about uh, somewhat today. Uh, he has uh, received a very long list of awards, many from uh, government organizations, including NOAA, multiple distinguished authorship awards from NOAA. He's a fellow of the American Meteorological Society, AMS, and the American Geophysical Union, AGU, uh, and has received many awards, including from those two societies. And I'll just mention two of them, uh, because it gives me an excuse to read out the citation, which gives you a little bit of a sense of, of, uh, uh, of what he's recognized for. Uh, he's received the Rossby Medal from the AMS, uh, uh, the, the citation being for fundamental insights into the dynamics of the Earth's climate through studies of idealized models and comprehensive climate simulations. Um, from my own perspective, the idea that uh, uh, of, of working through a hierarchy of different complexity of models is, is one aspect of Isaac's work that I've always found uh, fascinating. Uh, and I think most of you will appreciate the fact that in order to do reasonably uh, uh, simple models, you really need to understand everything that you're talking about. And uh, Isaac is one of the people who can actually do those things. Anyway, um, I think the most recent award, but I may have missed one, was the uh, Roger Revelle Medal from HEU, uh, with the citation for outstanding contributions in atmospheric sciences, atmosphere ocean coupling, atmosphere land coupling, biogeochemical cycles, climate, and related aspects of the Earth's system. This tells you that he's worked on almost everything there is to work on in regard to this subject. And last but not least, he's a long-standing, since 2003, member of the National Academy of Sciences. So please join me in welcoming one of the world's foremost climate scientists. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming. Is this loud enough? Can you hear me in the back? You know. By the way, the Roger Ravel Medal citation was actually the description of the medal. What didn't really <laughs> relate to my work. I don't work on that larger range of topics. It's okay. But it holds anyway, so. Yeah, I thought I'd try to talk today about what I think is one of the big uh, picture questions in climate science, which is how the uh, distribution of climates over the Earth is going to change as the, as the Earth warms, and in particular, the extent to which the tropics will expand, and the mid-latitude uh, storms and rain belts will move poleward. This is what we think is going to happen. We also know pretty much uh, with quite a certainty that in response to the ozone hole, this is one of those remarkable things, uh, that uh, I can never quite get used to, that the ozone hole has caused the mid-latitude westerlies in the southern hemisphere to move poleward by several degrees of latitude. And so we have these two things going on, and what we're seeing, especially in the southern hemisphere, is some amalgamation of the two. And it's a challenge to separate them and to uh, project what's going to happen in the future. That's what we'll try to talk about. I'm basically a fluid dynamicist, and so I, I'm going to introduce a couple of fluid dynamical concepts, which I think are 
They may seem kind of arcane to many of you, but I think they're central to thinking about this problem and why the middle latitude westerlies exist at all and uh, how they're going to respond in, uh, as the earth warms or as the ozone hole evolves in time. Um, so I apologize for having a couple of equations, but you don't have to actually have to understand where the equations come from. I think it's just uh, the goal will be to try to give you an essence of what the argument is. And hopefully, I'm not going to try to bring all these arguments up to date. There's a lot of ongoing research going on. I can't keep up with all of it. But hopefully, you'll, at least my goal is that you go away with some kind of uh, background with which you can perhaps uh, appreciate a little bit more some of the ongoing discussion that you hear about related to these uh, uh, poleward movements of the middle latitude circulation in the future. <clears throat> okay, so this is the kind of topics I'll be talking about. I'm going to emphasize the importance of the mid latitude westerlies for a second. And then uh, as a sort of substitute for thinking about derivations of the relevant fluid dynamics, I thought instead I'd try to motivate these key concepts by thinking about the uh, history of how we've come to understand them uh, for a little while. I may spend quite a bit of time on that. We'll see how it goes. Say a few words about the observed trends as we go on. The focus there will be mostly on the southern hemisphere. The southern hemisphere is kind of a, uh, I say, a, it's a simpler system. It's more zonally symmetric. By zonally symmetric, I mean independent of longitude. The climate is pretty zonally symmetric, and the northern hemisphere is more complex, and so it's sort of a practice. If we can understand what's going on in the southern hemisphere, we're probably in a better shape to approach these uh, northern hemisphere issues that are, in which the asymmetries of the climate uh, are a lot more important. And then we'll talk about simulated responses to the ozone hole and to global warming, both of which involve polar displacements of the mid-latitude circulation and if you like, of the boundary between the tropics and mid-latitude. This, this is sometimes referred to as an expansion of the tropics. It's the same thing. And I'd really like to get to, if I can, some of the, talk about some of the mechanisms underlying, underlying these responses, because that's, after all, what I work on and I'm still trying to understand. So I hope to get to that, see how it goes. Okay, this is a very schematic picture of the mid-latitude westerlies where we have the, uh, oops, the pole and the equator, and uh, this is supposed to be west to east. So meteorologists refer to this as westerlies because historically meteorologists have worried about where the air is coming from. Westerlies are coming from the west. Oceanographers talk about eastward currents because typically if they're in a boat to worry about where their boat is going in the eastward. Current. So this is from a meteorological perspective. So westerlies are winds that are from the west towards the east. I think we're all familiar with this basic idea that in mid-latitudes, there's a time average flow near the surface is westerly. And just from the simplest uh, geostrophic balance, the, the first thing you ask, what's in a rapidly rotating system like the Earth, is what's balancing the Coriolis force on these winds? And, it's the pressure gradient to zeroth order. So we have to have subpolar lows and subtropical highs. So those, understanding that pressure distribution is equivalent to understanding the uh, surface wind distribution. And in addition, we have, if we have westerlies near the surface, there's a drag on those westerlies. There's a force exerted by the surface on the atmosphere that's pushing the atmosphere to the west. This, oops. We'll get a hang of this eventually. Um, there's a westward surface stress, and then we also have to ask what's balancing the Coriolis, um, what's balancing that surface stress? Well, it's a Coriolis force on the north-south flow. And so you can infer just from the simplest kind of force balance in a rapidly rotating system that there's a poleward flow near the surface where the for the Coriolis force to balance that surface stress. And similarly, there's a equator flow over the easterlies. And so in the subtropics, you have a divergence of the mean circulation. And 
You can think of that as being closed in the vertical. My perspective isn't very good here, I don't think, but... Um, and this is the fer what's called the feral cell. We have the Hadley cell in the tropics, the feral cell in mid-latitudes. Historically, the existence of the feral cell was a real conundrum to uh, dynamical meteorologists who start first started thinking about this. Of course, they didn't know much about the upper levels, but they knew at the surface there was primarily a... Uh, the north-south flow is primarily poleward. And uh, so you have a divergence near the, in the subtropics, and most of the water vapor in the atmosphere is near the surface. So that divergence is carrying water away from the subtropics, and that's why we have subtropical deserts and uh, uh, arid regions. And so the, uh, the distribution of surface winds and the transition from easterlies to westerlies, if we understand that, we also understand why uh, the deserts and arid regions of the Earth are primarily in the subtropics. And if we understand how that boundary between the easterlies and westerly moves, we have some understanding, which goes along with it, of how those subtropical regions will move as well. All right, so is there anything mysterious about the existence of these surface westerlies? Not really, ever since we started Depends what we mean by mysterious, I guess, but ever since we started simulating the Earth's climate on computers, it goes back to the 1950s and the work of uh, Norman Phillips, uh, the surface westerlies and middle latitudes just pop out automatically. So you don't have to do anything special to your model to simulate them. And this is an example of something uh, I like to call the fruit fly of climate models. We can, this relates to this hierarchy of models that was referred to in the introduction. Uh, so this is an ideal gas on the sphere and simplified the radiative transfer that's heating and cooling the system as much as possible. And you, you need a little surface drag between the atmosphere and the ground to simulate anything that looks like the atmosphere, but there are no clouds, no latent heat release, no land sea contrast or mountains or seasonal diurnal cycles. And this is the east-west wind as a function of this is height and this is uh, latitude, equator in the middle. And so you, you get these mid-latitude surface westerlies. You don't need a whole lot of complexity in your system to simulate uh, these mid-latitude westerlies. And one of the interesting questions is to what extent when we're talking about how these westerlies are perturbed by warming or the ozone hole or whatever, to what extent can we use these idealized models to uh, try to understand those uh, sensitivities of the system to external factors and to what extent do we have to start adding in some of these complexities to really have a handle on those displacements um, and this so this fruit fly of climate models i'm calling it is still a extremely complicated turbulent chaotic system these are snapshots of the surface temperature and i guess this is upper tropospheric zonal winds on a gray scale just to illustrate the Still a lot of meteorological complexity going on this, but the climate is very simple and the, and the climate is distinguished by having these surface westerlies, even in these very idealized settings. Something to keep in mind. Uh, and just to um, keep things in perspective, if we take this fruit fly model and we change the parameters enough, you can do all sorts of things with it. Here I've increased the rotation rate by a factor of four. And what happens in that case is that whereas uh, for the Earth's rotation rate, we have a region, sort of familiar region of surface westerlies. The blue is the surface winds. When you increase the rotation rate by a factor of four, you have three regions of surface westerlies per hemisphere. It starts looking a little bit like Jupiter, in fact. I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, but we're not going to be talking about systems like this. So I'm not claiming to put the Earth's climate in some grand perspective of all possible atmospheric circulations here. That would be much too ambitious. So we're just talking about small perturbations away from an Earth-like uh, climate a regime here. And what's the state of the art? I'd say this is uh, one of our latest uh, atmospheric models, or GFDL. I shouldn't say R anymore because I've retired officially from GFDL, but this was a five or six year project, so I was involved in it to some extent. 
Um, and so this is the, uh, call the observed uh, distribution of zonally average winds as a function of latitude and height. These observations are actually what we call reanalysis. The weather bureaus around the world uh, have to make forecasts for some initial conditions. So they have to estimate the state of the atmosphere at, at the initial, as the initial condition of their forecast. That's often called an analysis of the state of the atmosphere. And a reanalysis is you go back with your state of the art climate model and you take the stream of incoming data for the last 30 or 50 years or whatever you have and you just pass it through the, your state of the art model. So you reanalyze the state of the atmosphere over time. And these reanalyses have basically come the repository of our understanding, our best estimate of what the atmosphere looks like, at least on these large scales in the troposphere. And this is uh, summer and, w and winter in the northern hemisphere. Uh, and you're showing both hemispheres here. And the seasonal cycle is probably our best climate change that we have to work with. I mean, you have to be able to simulate the changes in the circulation between summer and winter if you want to talk about other kinds of climate change. It's the best documented climate change we have. And uh, so you can get a feeling for how well our state-of-the-art models do in simulating the details, not just the existence of the surface westerlies here, but the di all the differences between summer and winter in the northern and southern hemisphere. And these are errors of biases that uh, these, these models make, and there's still substantial biases here. That we, we, they seem small compared to these. I'm not, let's not worry about the color scheme and the contours, but they're relatively small, but they're still significant, and we still worry about them. So are these models good enough to answer the questions that we want to ask about? the future of the wind field on Earth? That's another imp obviously important question. But we have to take the existence of these models into account if we do our research on the general circulation without looking at what these comprehensive climate models are telling us, that's kind of pointless. We have to relate our work to what the projections are from the world's climate modeling enterprise. Isaac, just for clarity, that's sure. latitude. That's right. Everything is averaged all around all longitudes here. In fact, everything I said. That's right. Minus. Yep. That's south, north. This is. Yep. Oh, I see. That's interesting. <laughs> that's why I uh, can't imagine how that. Good point. Thanks. Okay, so let's, let's get into the history now. And I want to sort of build to a, a concept that goes by different names, but I'm going to call it, uh, believe it or not, I'm going to call it pseudo-momentum conservation. And I'm going to argue that is the key concept that we need to understand all these theories that are being proposed for why the uh, circulation is expected to expand poleward. Uh, and if I try to trace this concept back in time as far as, uh, there are a couple of key points, but first, before even getting to that, there's this paper by Harold Jeffries in 1925, a famous geophysicist. I think many uh, in the audience will be familiar with his contributions to uh, the physics of the solid earth, but he also wrote some papers on the atmosphere. And this paper is generally recognized as a uh, watershed in which uh, Jeffries pointed out that he just focused on the angular momentum budget of the Earth. He said in mid-latitudes in the region of westerlies, the surface is always taking angular momentum out of the atmosphere. Angular momentum is measured as positive if the flow in the atmosphere is westerly. So it's in direction of the Earth's rotation. But So the surface of the Earth is always trying to slow down the surface westerlies, and that has to be replenished some of in a steady state to maintain surface westerlies. Uh, it seems like such a simple point. And then you have some scaling arguments. And it's, if you read this paper, at times it sounds like he's proving something, but I think it's just a, what we call a scale analysis nowadays, just estimating orders of magnitude. That the only plausible way you can maintain this angular momentum budget of the Earth is for large scale disturbances. Uh, to be transporting angular momentum into mid-latitudes. And by large-scale disturbances, it's the same scale disturbances that are transporting heat poleward 
And the answer is that heat transport is mostly near the surface. And it was known since uh, the mid-19th century that the polar heat transport in the atmosphere is dominated by these large-scale eddies, just cyclones and anticyclones. And because we knew, uh, they had a lot of surface observations, so they knew that right from the start when they started looking at surface winds and temperatures, that winds from the south were warm, and so you get a polar heat transport. But angular momentum budget was more mysterious, and it turns out that most of these fluxes actually, which was confirmed by uh, Victor Starr and colleagues, but not until after World War II, when a lot of upper air observations started coming in during the war and after that, these horizontal eddy momentum fluxes are primarily occurring just beneath the tropopause in the upper troposphere. They're not near the surface at all. Um, and so Jeffries was right about this, that uh, without very much observational support at all. But, and everything beyond this point in time around 1925, I think people just assumed, okay, we have to understand why the large scale A's in the atmosphere are converging angular momentum into mid-latitudes if we're gonna understand the surface westerlies, that those two things are basically synonymous. It may seem obvious in a way, but if we go back um, some of the earlier literature before Jeffries would focus on the surface pressure distribution, the highs and the lows, subtropical highs, subpolar lows, and the hydrostatic balance of surface pressures are related to what's going on in basically the weight of the column of air above you. Uh, so maybe that's what you should be focusing on, some kind of thermal budget or something of these regions of highs and lows, but that's just not the way to approach the problem as Jeffries understood. And nowadays we think of the pressure distribution as basically what we call a geostrophic adjustment. It's just adjusting to the wind field that's there because of the angular momentum budget. So I first uh, came into this, I started thinking about the general circulation of the atmosphere in uh, the early 1970s. I think my first paper on the subject was 1974, so I really don't want to subtract 1974 from 2020. It's a little scary. But, um, uh, but this was my Bible when I first entered the field. It's a beautiful monograph by Edward Lorenz, uh, the father of chaos theory, among other things. But called the nature and theory of the general circulation of the atmosphere. And at that point, he said. Uh, the problem of explaining the pattern of the transport of angular momentum by the eddies, that is the surface wind field, uh, he considered that the most important problem in general circulation theory among those for which we now lack a fairly adequate qualitative explanation. Um, I don't actually agree with this uh, statement. I think by around 1950 or so, I think we had what I would call a fairly adequate qualitative explanation, but I'm not sure how you measure whether a qualitative explanation is adequate or not. It's a little tricky, but um, it's interesting why Lorenz didn't, wasn't impressed by the work that I'll be describing here briefly. Um, I'm gonna skip over that and uh, maybe come back to it because time's flying, but uh, we'll go back to Lord Raleigh in a paper in 1880. He's an interesting scientist. We all know him. He, um, from the perspective of atmospheric physics, he explained, he's usually credited with explaining why the sky is blue from molecular scattering in the atmosphere. He uh, did a lot of work on seismological waves and uh, was one of the great, uh, he, also, he won the Nobel Prize for discovering argon of all things, which um, pretty amazing guy, but he was also one of the great fluid dynamicists of the late 19th century, uh, studying instability for the most part, including gra famously gravitational instability. But this was one of the things he discovered, which I don't think uh, gathered that much attention at the time. Which, so if you just take the simplest fluid dynamical flow, two-dimensional, incompressible, and viscid, you know, some kind of shear flow. You know, is it stable to infinitesimal perturbations? Will those perturbations grow or not? 
And he found this condition. His proof was pretty uh, obscure. If you go back to this paper. Uh, nowadays, we call it the Rayleigh's necessary condition for barotropic instability. Uh, that you need, and this flow has to have, of all things, an inflection point in it in order to be a candidate for instability. If there are no inflection points in this flow, no points at which the curvature changes sign, the flow is stable. Or we can say, if we think about vorticity, uh, vorticity in this problem is just the derivative of the flow u with respect to this dimension, let's call it y. If that vorticity distribution is monotonic, that is, if its gradient is always of the same sign, then the flow is stable. Um, so that result hung around for a while. Um, it was mo Do you know I want to? Okay. Uh, G.I. Taylor, another famous uh, fluid dynamicist that many of us uh, know other aspects of his work. But in particular, in 1914, he was trying to understand where Rayleigh's theorem came from. And he was able to derive it and his derivation is much simpler than Rayleigh's, and it's also much more physically motivated. It's a consequence of the conservation of momentum, and you can derive this conservation law, and without worrying ourselves too, mo too much about it, if this, uh, the quantity that's conserved here, P, which I'm gonna call the pseudo-momentum, um, is some positive definite measure of the amount of wave amplitude that's present, times the vorticity gradient, gamma. <coughs> so it has the sign of the vorticity gradient. And if you just think about it for a moment, I won't uh, dwell on it too much, but if you have a positive definite quantity that's conserved, there's no possibility of an instability. Uh, well, maybe I'll leave that as a homework exercise. Really. Um, and so this subsumed and was a more general proof of Rayleigh's criterion that if the vorticity gradient is of one sign that if there are no inflection points, uh, then the flow is stable. And in particular, it turned out you have a conservation law for pseudo-momentum where the flux of the pseudo-momentum is minus, this minus sign is all important, it turns out. It's minus the momentum flux. U is the eastward velocity here in this expression. V is the northward velocity. So U prime, V prime is sometimes called the Reynolds stress. It's the momentum transport due to the eddies. And uh, the pseudo-momentum flux is the negative of the momentum flux. Come back to that in a second. And uh, H, uh, it's HL cool, sorry about that. 1949 extended this result. It took until 1949 to do this, I think. Uh, in intervening years, the Rossby and others spent a lot of time studying the two-dimensional flow on the surface of a sphere. And uh, Kuo looked at that problem from the point of view of Rayleigh's criterion. And this is a rotating sphere, and it turns out that if now we consider the flow of the rotation and the departure from that rotation, called the, the departure of the rotation from the solid of rotation U, then you have to be careful that if that uh, the solid body rotation of the Earth introduces an effective vorticity gradient beta, which is positive everywhere. Now all of a sudden, whereas in a typical laboratory jet, you have inflection points all over the place, for the flow on the surface of a sphere, typically the flow is stable. That is, there's, if you include this so-called beta effect, uh, the upper, if we're gonna apply this in the upper troposphere where the eddy momentum fluxes are observed to occur. That flow is stable. You're not gonna be able to understand the eddy momentum fluxes by thinking about the instability of that flow. And then the key paper, to my mind, I don't know if everyone agrees with this, was another paper by Kuo in 1951, where I was just putting two and two together, saying we, he didn't write it in quite this way, but this is, uh, I think, legitimately you can interpret the argument in the paper in this way that if you just consider a climate now, a statistically steady state of the pseudo-momentum in the upper troposphere, you have a source and a sink 
of a wave activity, say, and, they, and it's being redistributed through the momentum fluxes. And we can, in a steady state, we can understand the sign of the momentum flux convergence just by thinking about the sources and sinks of wave activity. And the surface westerlies, if you get the signs right, are where the source of wave activity, the source of waves in the upper tr troposphere is greater than the sink. So if you have a source in mid-latitudes, and the waves disperse to the north and south of that source before they're dissipated in the upper troposphere. We call that the sink. And in mid-latitudes, the source is bigger than the sink. And that's why you have surface westerlies. So from this picture, the surface westerlies exist because your exciting waves in mid-latitudes, those waves are dispersing. And the, as we say, the flux of momentum is opposite in sign to the flux of pseudo-momentum, and so they're bringing momentum into mid-latitudes. I said this would be kind of an arcane argument, but the 60s and 70s, people started thinking about this in even simpler terms, trying to understand it better, and just arguing in terms of what we call the group velocity of Rossby waves. That these disturbances of the <coughs> upper troposphere, you can think of just the order as Rossby waves, named after the most famous meteorologist of the 20th century, Carl Gustav Rossby. And you can argue just from simplest wave propagation considerations that the group velocity of Rossby waves is opposite in sign to their Reynolds stress to their momentum flux. So if we have Rossby waves dispersing to the north or to the south of some region source of waves, then they're bringing momentum opposite in sign to their group velocity into the source region, creating the surface westerlies. I think that's the uh, essence of the picture that we're going to need. And uh, I'll skip over some of the additional results that sort of uh, supported this picture in the 60s and 70s. And I don't know if I have too much time to discuss this a paper that I did with Bill Randall in 1991. Uh, I was just trying to convince myself that the upper troposphere disturbances are really wave like, that they're carrying momentum like Rossby waves. And so we divided the momentum flux in the atmosphere, doing a space-time spectrum of the eddies, into momentum flux due to waves of different phase speed c. And uh, that's so integrated over wave number and just left the phase speed dependence of the momentum flux. This is a function of latitude and phase speed. And this, we're in the upper troposphere, and this is the picture of the upper level winds in the atmosphere in some time average sense. The characteristic of Rossby waves is they propagate westward with respect to the wind in which they're embedded. They may propagate eastward with respect to the surface, but they're propagating westward with respect to the mean winds. And that's totally satisfied when you compute this, this phase speed spectrum. All the waves carrying momentum are propagating westward with respect to the winds, just like a self-respecting Rossby wave. And in addition, we see, especially in the southern hemisphere, that if you look at the sign of this momentum flux, that the um, momentum flux is flowing into the mid-latitude region, carried by waves of phase speed between 0 and 50 meters per second. And that's a signature, as we've argued, of waves propagating out of this region. So outward propagation is for Rossby way synonymous with inward uh, convergence of momentum into the forced region. And so this paper sort of convinced me that yes, you can think in, in the upper troposphere of what some of us called Ross, Rossby wave chromatography, that the Rossby waves of a certain phase speed actually get separated out as they propagate poleward. And if you like deposit or break, wave breaking occurs at different latitudes depending on their phase speed, just as you'd expect from a uh, theory of Rossby waves propagating on a mean flow. So at least historically that convinced me that this was a good picture of what was going on. So here's, from this perspective, just to summarize it, especially for those of you who didn't uh, follow it that well, is that we have a conservation law for this quantity that uh, 
if the difference between the source of this quantity measuring the amplitude of the waves and the sing tells us what the momentum fluxes are. Those momentum fluxes have to be balanced by surface wind stress. So they tell us the pattern of the surface winds. So I'd like to argue in the re remaining time, to the extent that we have time, that for the ozone hole, the pri primary thing that's happening is that you know, we can focus either on the source of the waves or the sink of the waves. For the ozone hole, it seems to be the case that the dominant mechanism that's producing a polar shift to the westerlies when ozone is removed from uh, high latitudes is that you change the sink in, of the Rossby waves in subpolar latitudes. And that changes the source minus the sink and therefore changes the surface winds. For global warming, I think the most plausible explanation, there are many ex partial explanations out there, but I think the dominant one is a change in the source in the subtropics, that there's a reduction in the source of waves coming into the upper troposphere in the subtropics, and that results in a polar shift of the uh, pattern of momentum convergence. Uh, so I think both of these problems sort of exercise different parts of this picture and uh, but I think they're they're both subsumed by this um, sort of qualitative way of thinking about what's producing the eddy momentum fluxes in the atmosphere. Maybe I should emphasize at this point that the theory for these momentum fluxes has nothing to do with some negative viscosity or turbulent diffusion or in fact these theories are not, don't focus on the momentum fluxes directly if you look at the, where these expressions come from. They come from thinking about vorticity fluxes, not from momentum fluxes. So they're very different from uh, turbulent diffusion of momentum or anything like that. They relate more to changing wave characteristics, characteristics of wave propagation in the upper troposphere. So it's a little bit hard to get our mind around this and I'm not sure how to or if, if it's important to try to um, create some understanding in, in the larger world of what the fluid dynamics is that's governing this, such an important change in our climate system, this poleward migration of the, of the mid-latitude circulations. I don't quite know how to do that. Let's talk about the ozone hole for a few seconds. Uh, um, ever since the early 2000s, we've known that the Roaring 40s, if you like, they're probably better known as the Roaring 50s, um, especially in the last few years. They've moved poleward by several degrees. Latitude, this is in his only average sense, from 1960 to 2000. Again, these observations are really reanalyses of the kind that I introduced earlier. We expect from models that both the ozone hole and warming of the atmosphere and the ocean surface would tend to push this, lat this latitude of maximum westerlies poleward. And I think just about all recent research points to the fact that most of the observed shift that we've seen is due to the ozone hole, not to global warming itself. Um, I think it's amazing that our aerosol spray cans and uh, refrigerants have actually moved the roaring 40s a couple degrees of latitude forward. It's hard to get your mind around that fact. There's some simulations we did a number of years ago where showed in, if you put uh, uh, if you just do simulations of the atmosphere with both the ozone hole prescribed and with surface temperatures prescribed, that you can simulate this uh, shift reasonably well. Uh, the red is observations and these other lines here are ensemble of models. I guess the blue is the mean of all the runs of that model. And this is a model with observed sea surface temperatures. This is a free running global climate model where the oceans and the atmosphere interact and Either one produces this shift in the southward shift of the mid-latitude westerlies. But more recently, this is updating this data up to 2019, there hasn't been much of a displacement in the last 10 or 20 years 
of these southern hemisphere westerlies. Most of that displacement occurred from the uh, 70s through the 90s. And that's precisely when the ozone hole was developing. It's another reason to believe this shift was ozone hole related. Uh, this turns out to be simulated in all sorts of models. It's, they all produce more or less the same result, but if you look quantitatively, there's, there can be a difference of as much as a factor of two in the, in the response of our climate models to an ozone hole generation. And this is going back to the fruit fly model. Just what happens when you put in the ozone hole is that you, you lose the heating due to the ozone, the absorption of solar radiation. And that results in a, a cooling of the polar cap in the southern hemisphere over Antarctica that increases the north-south temperature gradients. And that, in, through a simple geostrophic balance, that increases the strength of the winds in high latitudes in the stratosphere. And so if you just take this fruit fly model or some other idealized model and you play around with the stratospheric winds, this is height and latitude again. Just, these are pretty dramatic changes in stratospheric winds here. And you can get very large changes in the latitude of the surface westerlies. And so also in these idealized models, they, they cap, whatever the dynamics is that's coupling the stratospheric strength of the stratospheric vortex or the stratospheric wind fields to the surface, again, it's captured in these idealized dynamical models. You don't need a whole lot of complexity. These are huge changes in wind, I should. There's been a lot of work, I'd say most of the work done on trying to understand the, dynam the fluid dynamics of this connection between the ozone hole and the surface winds has been done in models of this type. Because uh, it seems to be adequate. This, I think, is my favorite paper. There, there are a lot of papers that have this flavor, but what is happening, uh, I just give you a, um, very roughly, if you believe in the pseudo momentum conservation perspective, what you have to do if you're trying to manipulate the sink of the distribution of the sink or the dissipation of the waves in the upper troposphere is uh, well, one way of doing it is to, uh, as these waves propagate towards the pole, if some of them are reflected, and so. If they just propagate towards the pole, eventually they'll dissipate and break at high latitudes. But if you can prevent that from happening by if a lot of those waves reflect and return to mid latitudes, in fact, just into the subtropics. And that seems to be the best way of controlling the amount of uh, dissipation in the subpolar latitudes. And, uh, Lorentz is a different Lorentz than Ed Lorentz. In 2014, had this schematic and argue that this is more or less what's happening. I think there's, uh, it's plausible that as you have stronger subpolar winds, you, for reasons related to the Rossby wave dispersion relation, you have more of these waves reflect and they don't break in subpolar latitudes, but they tend to break further south. And if by reducing that sink, you increase the source minus the sink, which the source minus the sink is your theory for the surface westerlies. So you're manipulating the sink, upper tropospheric sink of the Rossby waves in, in generating the uh, response of the surface westerlies to the ozone hole. So it's a pretty elaborate theory. I wish there was something a little simpler because a lot of us are interested in this polar displacement of the westerlies in response to the ozone hole. It has a lot of consequences for different parts of the climate system, as well as impacts, for example, in Australia. Um, but this is what uh, I think the theory points to. It's an argument something like this, where you take the Rossby wave dispersion relation and propagation seriously, and you have to try to argue where those waves dissipate. But you're not necessarily manipulating the source of the waves. And I'll jump over that one as well. Let's move to greenhouse gases, and they produce a similar shift of the westerlies and in both hemispheres, but uh, this is an estimate from one particular model. There, this is over the period 1960 to 2000. The response to greenhouse gases is maybe a third or 
a fourth of the response to ozone over that period. It's a period where ozone is changing very rapidly. The greenhouse gases have been you know, increasing much more gradually over time. Um, but at least for this period in which the ozone hole is developing, the argument for models is basically this, that they're dominated by the ozone hole. Uh, if you look at the response to uh, CO2 only, these are from experiments in which the CO2 is just quadrupled instantaneously. This is a standard experiment, experiment that's becoming more and more popular. You wait 100 or 150 years and then you compare to your initial condition and ask what's happening. And this is the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere. And the southern hemisphere, again, we get a more or less symmetric increase. These solid lines are the climatological position of the uh, strong surf westerly surface winds and the sh shading is the is the uh, change in response to uh, increasing co2 and again it's a poleward shift it's largest in uh, again in uh, southern summer northern winter that's an interesting fact that's true for the ozone hole as well and just illustrating how complex the situation is in the northern hemisphere it's not as only a symmetric response. I think you can argue that over Europe and the Mediterranean, again, you're getting a poleward shift of the circulation projected, which is similar to what the projection is in the Southern Hemisphere, but over the Pacific, things are very different, more complex, and there's a lot of variation across models. And what's happening in the Pacific is that the models, the response of El Nino in the models is overwhelming the uh, global warming response. El Nino, if, it's, if you're biased towards an El Nino state or a La Nina state as a consequence of warming, that'll tend to dominate what's happening in the Pacific over these kinds of zonally symmetric arguments. So that's one source of complexity in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so as far as combining the uh, global warming and ozone hole projections, this is something from Elizabeth Barnes fairly recently, just showing that it depends a lot on what em emission scenario you're looking at. That over the period where the ozone hole is developing, this, these are simulations from some set of climate models for classic, uh, this high-end emission scenario for the 21st century, and sort of a middle scenario and a very low end value. And at the low end, the ozone hole is expected to heal more or less exponentially over the century. Um, in that case, we've probably experienced the maximum polar displacement in the southern hemisphere that we're going to see. Because as the ozone hole heals, it's sort of balanced out by some modest effect of greenhouse warming. But if uh, you're at the high end emission scenario, we're just starting along a pathway of a larger and larger displacement. This red line is just a schematic. Um, so we'll, um, I think this is an interesting metric to have when you're thinking about impacts in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, you want to put yourself on a um, emission trajectory where hopefully you're not going to exacerbate the uh, impacts associated with this polar displacement that's already occurred due to the ozone hole. Something to think about. So what's going on with uh, global warming? Uh, again, there are a lot of explanations. This will be my last point. That one thing that happens in response to warming is that the atmosphere likes to be on something close to a moist adiabat, which means you have more water in, in the atmosphere with warming. And so as you lift a parcel, you condense out that water. So in addition to the adiabatic cooling you get when you lift a parcel, you get some warming due to condensation. If there's more condensation, you don't, temperature doesn't drop as much. So you end up with larger temperature changes aloft than near the surface. It's a classic explanation that Suki talked about. I don't know if Suki's here today, but back uh, before I started thinking about this problem, 1960s. Uh, and that's observed in all of our climate models. So what does that have to do with the uh, surface westerlies? Well, here's a little picture that what's determining uh, the source, the baroclinic source of waves, what determines the uh, 
where the tropics ends and the middle latitude starts. One simple way of thinking about it, I think, is that in the, looking in the upper troposphere, you have a Hadley cell, which is trying to conserve angular momentum as it moves poleward. And if you think about what conservation of angular momentum means, as you're moving poleward, you're moving closer to the axis of rotation, so you're spinning up a circulation. So this angular momentum conserving flow, uh, idealization of the flow that the Hadley cell is trying to create is, it's more or less parabolic, increasing with latitude. This is some non-dimensional measure of the wind. Don't worry about that. Uh, then we have simple theories of baroclinic instability, again, due to Charney and others and Edie in the mid uh, 20th century. And uh, finite amplitude extensions of some of those theories suggest that middle latitude eddies will try to create a uh, upper level wind profile that has a particular shape that I've drawn here schematically. And that uh, this uh, upper level wind field or equivalently temperature gradient that middle latitude eddies are trying to maintain depends on the static stability. We have a larger static stability in the atmosphere, and by static stability here I mean the um, effectively the uh, adiabatic lapse rate. That if if you now forget about moisture in the atmosphere, but moisture has created this background more or less moist adiabatic uh, profile. Your dry stability has increased because your temperature has increased more aloft than it has at low levels, and that's a stabilizing effect. So you've increased the static stability of the atmosphere to dry vertical displacements. And uh, according to this, or any kind of related theory for the, the effect of baroclinic instability on the atmosphere, this mid-latitude dynamics, with a larger static stability, this uh, uh, wind field that the baroclinic turbulence is trying to generate uh, increases. And so the transition, if you like, where the Hadley cell breaks down, moves forward as your static stability, especially in the subtropics, increases. I think this is, so this is why the source, as you warm, moves forward because you've stabilized the subtropical margins of the unstable region. Uh, everything else follows from that. I think there are a number of our other theories that have been proposed, but I think this is still the most plausible. Uh, so it depends on the moist adiabatic warming of the atmosphere, more warming aloft than at the surface. That increases the static stability of the atmosphere that's seen by these large instabilities that are transporting heat. And there are those ways are the source of the upper level disturbances that are then dispersing and creating your momentum fluxes. But here you're changing the location of the source rather than uh, skewing where the sink occurs. So it's a rather different argument focusing on the source rather than the sink. Um, and just some results that are supporting that argument. So. When I look at this uh, subject at this point, I, I don't know if I've kept up with everything going on in the literature, but my feeling is that the most compelling qualitative mechanisms for these polar displacements, which I think are gonna color a lot of discussions of climate change over the next century, uh, especially the latter one, uh, but they can both be understood in this, in, from the point of view of the pseudo-momentum conservation law that goes back to G.I. Taylor effectively in the early 19th century. On the ozone hole, you're manipulating the wave sink in the upper troposphere. And in the global warming case, you're manipulating the source, primarily in the subtropics. And it's the source minus the sink that's providing your schematic theory for the distribution of the surface westerlies. Um, so it's, it's a little intimidating, but this is, I think, I think this is what's going on. So I can't, uh, I don't know if I can simplify it too much more than that. Uh, these are fascinating problems, and there's a lot of ongoing work that, and some of that work uh, questions this basic uh, bifurcation that I've described here. But I don't have time to go into that, thankfully. 
Uh, so I think I'll just thank you for listening and <laughs> putting up with me. <laughs>I think the question of the, first of all, that the trend in the strength of the Hadley cell might also actually be related to these trends in the boundary of the Hadley cell, but I won't go into that part of the argument, but I actually think that's plausible, that uh, in the reanalysis, re if you have a model that's strength of the Hadley cell is biased, and you're, you're continuing, basically, with, in the reanalysis, you're trying to nudge the observations, nudge the model as it runs to the observations that... Uh, it's a little counterintuitive, but you can construct a simple model that will result in pushing the Hadley cell in the wrong direction. Uh, I'm not explaining it very well, but yes, I, I think it's plausible. Yeah, but it's kind of um, paradox to think that the data has gone and the models are done. Yeah. The Hadley cell is not easily observed directly. It's an ageostrophic circulation, and typically all your observations are constraining your geostrophic, particularly your east-west flows, and if you nudge towards the correct east-west flow and you don't have the wrong, say, tropical heating, you can push the Hadley cell in the wrong direction. So. That was one of the things I referred to that uh, sort of goes against this. I skipped over this, but so very schematically with global warming, you have a sort of cooling in the stratosphere and that extends uh, you know, to lower latitudes in the subpolar. This is very schematic. And so you're tending to, um, uh, anyway, between the, um, subtropical, the tropical warming in the polar regions, as you say, you're tending to increase this temperature gradient. And also across the tropopause, because typically you'll be cooling in the stratosphere. Whereas at the surface, at least in the northern hemisphere, expect the opposite. So there's some compensation in the temperature gradient changes in the northern hemisphere, uh, which makes the wind changes less weaker than you might expect. But in the, at least in the transient simulations in the, of our climate models in the southern hemisphere, loosely speaking, the, uh, the surface polar amplification is delayed because of the uh, heat uptake by the oceans. And so you t in the southern hemisphere, you tend to have the upper level increase in temperature gradient that's not compensated as much by the surface. So you might expect more of an, a response to this upper level changes in the wind field. Um, in the southern hemisphere in global warming simulations. And that's been argued that actually that the dynamics of the wind shift in the southern hemisphere of global warming simulations might actually have a more similar dynamics to the one I've described for the ozone hole than this subtropical stabilization mechanism. So I think that's still up in the air. It's probably a combination of the two. But when you look across models, it seems like they're beautifully correlated. The uh, this poleward shift of the westerlies and of the boundary of the Hadley cell are just beautifully correlated with the change in subtropical stability. That's my impression. So I'm still leaning in that direction as being the dominant mechanism. <laughs>
not a lot of them have sure. physical food in it. So the observation, you emphasize the, the role of simple models. A couple times, yeah. And you highlighted the fact that the shift in the uh, westerlies uh, towards the pole is a small change over many years. So you might ask, I suppose, but maybe this is the main question, is there a perturbation calculation that one can think about that's not simulation based, but through your simple model that more directly links the, sh the change, the small changes to the input parameters that you emphasize? Yeah, so this, these idealized dry models have been really been put through the ringer in the last few years, and people have developed beautiful linear response functions where you can, uh, just by doing millions of simulations for a long, using a lot of computer time, you can map out how that circulation responds to just about any kind of perturbation, at least zonally symmetric perturbation. So that's all been mapped out, but it's still not getting at, which I think is very extremely useful information. You can stop there if you like. That's, but a lot of us would still like to understand what the essence of those responses are. Why does a perturbation of one kind produce a poleward shift, perturbation of another kind? And that's getting at uh, the core of the geophysical fluid dynamics that's hard to, hard to penetrate. I didn't mention the ice ages, sorry, Danny. But, uh, <laughs> I think the, uh, if you just take a more idealized model that doesn't have the full Earth geography, then they respond pretty linearly, as sort of I was implying, is that if you warm them, the uh, westerlies move poleward. If you cool them, the westerlies move equatorward. Which is, if you just stop there, you say, okay, that seems to fit uh, Ice Age data better. But then when you introduce uh, particularly sea ice in Antarctic, and you think if you have more sea ice, you're going to increase uh, the local SST gradients potentially in the subpolar regions. And that's just through simple sort of instability arguments, you're going to increase the wave source there, which is going to have the opposite effect. Just increasing the wave source, not doing anything else is going to move the westerlies. They're just gonna follow the source. And so that uh, there's a balancing act there. there so I think you know, just heating and cooling in the abstract without doing anything else, you'll, you'll go the way you want to for your ice age uh, picture. But these other things come in and maybe the models are exaggerating them or they seem to be making it look more complicated, I agree. And um, I, I haven't looked at it recently, but the last time I looked, the models, simulations of the uh, shifts in the last glacial maximum, there was a large spread there. In the Well, in the, it went by pretty quickly, but the argument I favored for the expansion of the Hadley cell with warming was basically an energetic argument in the sense that you're uh, suppressing instability, which is trying to transport energy poleward. So you don't have to think about the momentum budget when thinking about that subtropical stability argument. But then you have to say, how does that relate to the surface westerlies? And the bottom line is, I think, as Jeffries argued pretty convincingly, evidently, 
By the way, when I go back and read Jeffrey's paper, I don't understand why all of a sudden people just believe that <laughs> rather than focusing on, say, the highs and the lows. Or anyway, that's a tangent. Um, but you have, to, you have to balance the momentum budget. To, uh, and there's really no way to maintain the surface westerlies without converging momentum into it. And so at some point, you have to talk about that. It might be a slave to the energy transport, but you have to, you have to explain that. I think the main problem, as a number of people in the audience know for the northern hemisphere, is that our simulations of the force response to warming in the northern hemisphere don't uh, agree very well with what we've seen. I'm referring primarily to the tropics and to the, uh, if you like, the El Nino-like or La Nino-like behavior of the uh, temperature gradients in the tropics. And so uh, when you look at the model's force responses, uh, over the Pacific, they don't resemble the observe observations. Uh, and then without that observational basis, you can go ahead and look at the model responses over time. And, and one thing you see in these four times CO2 simulations is it's getting a lot of attention recently that over time you see the Pacific response changing its character. In fact, some of the models change a sign over time. It starts out looking uh, La Nina-ish and then becomes El Nino-ish over time and then the shift in the jet in the Pacific is a um, change of sign as well. But uh, over the Mediterranean, it looks like the force response looks relatively simple, in the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. But there also, the observations are, I mean, there's potential for a lot of multi-decadal variability in the Atlantic as well. So it's hard to get an observational foothold uh, to uh, base your confidence in. Um, in the Southern Hemisphere, I think because of the ozone hole, we think we're, we're sort of on the right track. But as far as the global warming response is concerned, because the ozone hole has been so big of a thing, remarkably, um, our constraint on the global warming force part of the wind response is not very good. We have to be more precise in our ability to uh, predict the response to the ozone hole if we want to use the residual to uh, constrain our CO2 response. So. Thank you. Just a few people there in the pseudo momentum edge of it. There's no need to really understand it. You just have to sort of. Yeah, no, no, I think the explanation was.